Today we are very pleased and honored to welcome Neil Kashkari, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, to our LAI chapter. Mr. Kashkari has been the president of the Minneapolis Fed for two years. His career before coming to the Fed has been both varied and distinguished. He began his career as an aerospace engineer, I read, um, uh, working in technology for NASA. And after obtaining an MBA, he went into the financial area and joined Goldman Sachs in San Francisco. In 2006, Mr. Kashkari began working in the public sector and held several uh, senior positions with the U.S. Department of Treasury, including serving as assistant uh, deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury overseeing the Troubled Assets Relief Program. And he received the Alexander Hamilton Award, which is the Department of Treasury's um, highest honor for distinguished service. After returning to the private sector in 2009 with PIMCO, um, he forayed back into public service with a run for Governor of California in 2014. And he focused his platform on economic opportunity. As president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank, he oversees all operations of the bank, including supervision and regulation and payment services. And of course, he's also a leading monetary policy maker and is just finishing a term uh, as a voting member of the Federal Open Market Committee. The newspaper article today had some uh, reportage on his uh, perspectives and his dissent from some of the positions taken by that committee, something I think that we will hear more about today. Um, President Kashkari plans to make some initial opening remarks to us, and then Chuck Liddy is going to um, moderate a Q&A session. Uh, Nick and I will be s circulating the room with microphones. Um, this program is being live streamed and will be archived on the Federal uh, Bank's website. So, with that, join me in welcoming Neil Kashkari. So, first of all, thank you. You know, why don't you come on up here? I'll be very brief, and then we can just go right into the discussion. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, and I really want to make this interactive, and I'm here to learn from you as much as I am to share with you my perspectives. And so, the more candid you are with me, the more I'm going to learn from you. And let me just start for a couple minutes and tell you a little bit about why I'm here and why the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is here, because a lot of people don't know this. So our nation has always hated the idea of having a central bank at all. It just sounded very undemocratic, a bunch of bankers in a dark room doing God knows what. Alexander Hamilton created the first uh, central bank of the U.S., then they got rid of it, then they created a, central, a second one, they got rid of it, and then our economy was hammered with banking crises in the late 1800s. And then a really big one, the banking panic of 1907. And then the US Congress said, well, even though we still hate the idea of having a central bank, I guess we need to have one. But let's distribute the power around the country so it's not concentrated in Washington, DC, or New York, not under the thumb of the president or the Congress. So they created this unique structure of a board of governors in Washington, D.C. You've heard of Janet Yellen, the current chair of the board, or before her, Ben Bernanke or Alan Greenspan. The board of governors are all appointed by the President of the United States. There's seven of them total and confirmed by the U.S. Senate. But then you have 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks, including the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis. And our jobs are to represent you, represent our region, what we call the Ninth Federal Reserve District, which is Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and Northwestern Wisconsin. And importantly, I was not appointed by the President of the United States. I was appointed by a board of directors of local leaders from our region. And this is a key design feature that Congress created 100 years ago, 103 years ago, to distribute the power so that there's more direct representation in monetary policy from the people. That's what they came up with. And I think it is, it's not perfect. But I do think it has served the country well over the 103 years that we've had the Federal Reserve. And it's something unique to our country. So that's why we're here. And so a lot of my time, I, I explain my job. as I, There's three components to my job. One component of my job is management. We have about 1,000 employees at the Minneapolis Fed. And there are management challenges associated with that. About a third of my time is deeply involved in policy development. So monetary policy, I spend a lot of my time on. 
looking at data and reports and forecasts, uh, bank regulatory policy and other things. And then about a third of my time I spent going out around our region hearing from people like you, from community leaders, from business leaders, from workers, what's happening in the economy, what's happening in the job market, what are the challenges to make me more informed so that when I go back to Washington, D.C. eight times a year and we talk about monetary policy for the nation, I'm able to directly represent what's happening in the Ninth Federal Reserve District. And so meetings like this are actually very important to me because it gives me a chance to hear directly from you what's on your mind, what are the challenges that you're seeing. So let me just make one other comment, then I'm going to turn it over to Chuck and turn it over to all of you. One of the things that has surprised me as I've traveled around our region is every single city I have visited, large or small, booming economy or lagging economy, every single town and city I've visited has complained about affordable housing. Every single one. And it makes me scratch my head and say, what's going on here? Because, you know, a, a strong economy does not solve this. Because if everybody's wages are going up, prices are going to go up, and it doesn't actually solve an affordable housing problem. So one of my observations, what can be, what is common among, among all these cities? One of my observations that our researchers at the Fed agree with me on is that local restrictions, while well-intentioned, multiple overlap each other and then drive up the minimum cost of entry into the housing market, and they drive up the barriers to affordable housing, even though each of those is well-intentioned. So I live in a city, I live in Orno in the western suburbs. I don't know what our minimum lot size is. I think it's probably an acre. Uh, that's an example of a well-intentioned barrier that when you add a, a bunch of these well-intentioned barriers, all of a sudden the minimum cost of a house is much higher than maybe it needs to be. And so one of my observations is we probably all need to take a hard look in the mirror at what we are doing to drive up the cost of housing for low-income families to try to get a foot in the door. But I'd like to make this part of our conversation to hear from all of you because I know uh, you all work in and around the real estate market. So I'd like to understand from you what you think the barriers are and how this can be. Because the question I always ask people is, you know, why aren't greedy developers barreling in here to provide supply when there is demand? What are the barriers? And I'm not saying greedy developers. I'm not actually passing judgment. I'm saying if they're ap operating in their own self-interest, they're going to take advantage of this good economic opportunity. There's got to be some barrier that's preventing that from happening. So local regulations, I think, is one of those barriers. But I'd like to hear from all of you on what, what else you think it is. So with that, let me just pause there. I'll turn it over to Chuck, and then we'll turn it over to all of you. Uh, yeah, and the intent is make this really a, an open discussion. I've got some questions that we had prepared in advance. Uh, uh, and very interesting in looking at the, on the website on Neil's uh, background and also the background of the Federal Reserve. One would never have thought that the Federal Reserve was rocket science, but evidently you, uh, <laughs> by joining, you know, we do have a rocket scientist now who is on the, the uh, governor. That was a long time ago. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> very interesting. Um, so we're a land economics organization, and that's our interest. Um, and obviously, interest rates have a huge impact on what we as architects, developers, contractors do. What are the things that the Fed do, do that, uh, or influence that has uh, either direct impact or indirect impacts on what the people sitting in this room uh, are doing? In terms of monetary policy? Right. Yeah, well, so Congress has given the Fed what we call our dual mandate. You may hear us talk about this, which is stable prices, and we've defined that as 2% inflation year over year, and maximum employment, as many people who want to work are able to find jobs. And it's been noted that I have dissented. We've raised interest rates three times this year, 25 basis points in March, in June, and now again last week. In each of those cases, I, was, I dissented. I voted against those interest rate increases. The reason I did that is that, number one, for the last five or six years, we've been coming in too low in our inflation target. We've been hitting around 1.5% inflation instead of 2%. So I'm not seeing inflationary pressures building that would be concerning. And then second, there still seems to be slack in the labor market. So the headline unemployment rate, which gets a lot of attention, has fallen from around 10% at the peak of the recession to 4.1% today. Usually you would say, wow, that must be a very, very tight labor market. But along the way, we keep seeing that there are more workers on the sidelines who are not included in that statistic. Because that statistic only includes people who, are, who have a job or who are looking for a job. If you've given up, you're not counted in the statistic. 
So by our estimates, there's more than a million people who are of working age who are still on the sidelines relative to 2006 or 2007. And we're not seeing wage pressures building. The way we think it works is you have a strong job market. Businesses are competing for workers. They have to increase their wages to attract or keep their workers. Those higher wages then translate into higher inflation when they pass those costs onto their customers. Well, we're not seeing inflation climbing. We're below target. And we're not seeing wages climbing. We're also surprised that the wages are so low. That tells me there's probably more slack in the labor market than we expect. And so my question that I've been asking my colleagues is, why are we raising interest rates if we're undershooting inflation and there still seems to be slack in the labor market? And since I first dissented in March, we expected inflation to go up. It has since fallen. Oh, yeah. So it's moved in the opposite direction. And the job market has continued to be strong, but wages are not yet climbing. So that, to me, is good evidence that we should allow the labor market to continue to heal, allow wages to start to climb before we start tapping the brakes on monetary policy. And then more recently, we've started to see something that's called the yield curve flattening. So if you look at the interest rates on US government debt, the yield curve is the difference between the 10-year debt rate and the two-year debt rate. It has started to flatten, which historically has been a sign of nervousness that maybe economic growth in the future will be slower than we think. That's another reason, adding on to the first two reasons, why I'm, I'm asking the question, why should we raise rates until we actually see inflationary pressures building? Are there some <clears throat> parameters that the, the Federal Reserve looks at with regards to, um, if everything was a perfect world, inflation would be at between such and so, unemployment would be such and so. Uh, growth would be such and so. Are there any parameters like that, that that you're shooting for? We do. I mean, we put out once a quarter. So in December, we just put it out what we call the Summary of Economic Projections. And this is on the Federal Reserve's website. Each FOMC participant puts out his or her own forecast, and then it's called the dot plot. And you can see our expectations for interest rates. And we also put out expectations for long-run trends. So economic growth, real GDP growth, we think is in the order of 2% real GDP growth. You would think that if inflation stabilizes at 2% and neutral interest rates are roughly zero to a half, you could think about a long run federal funds rate in the two to two and a half percent range if everything gets to normal. But what is normal? And normal, what is normal historically seems like it's changing over time. And so whether we get to this neutral steady state or shocks hit the economy, upside or downside, that tends to happen. We never really ever get to neutral, normal. Things happen, and we have to respond to that. It's interesting. There's a question in the, yeah. Just to follow up, then, where is the pressure coming to raise the interest rates? What's the opposite perspective yeah. and so, interested parties? Yeah, the opposite perspective that my colleagues would share is that they're worried that the headline unemployment rate at 4.1% signals that the labor market is really tight and that inflationary pressures are in fact building, even though it's not showing up yet in the data, and that we might be surprised six months from now or a year from now, and all of a sudden there's higher inflation, and then we have to then go and raise rates quickly to try to keep that under control. And that's not a, that's not a crazy argument. It's just not supported by the data. And so I, my pushback is, you know, the Federal Reserve has very powerful tools to lower inflation. We can always raise rates. We have very limited tools to lift inflation because rates are already quite low. And given our asymmetric tools, my judgment is we are better off letting inflation come to us than preemptively cutting off the expansion by raising rates prematurely. Are there any other questions from uh, you along this line? Yeah, Brad. So, so Neil. You want to get the mic over there? Oh, thanks. <laughs> wow. That's, a, that's the fastest I've ever seen him move. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a question, actually I have several, but the, the one I wanted to ask now is, when you take a position, are you representing the region's perspective, and is it possible that some of the other regional presidents see the world different because the market is very different in their region? Yeah, it's a good question. The answer is uh, no. I think we are all, because there's one monetary policy and there's one currency for the whole nation, we have to make our best judgments and our best advice for the nation as a whole. But I am looking at what's happening in our district to inform the data that I'm looking at. So when I go out and I meet with 
businesses large and small. And I, I always ask them, are you able to find workers? And the most often answer I get is, no, I can't find workers. It's impossible. The next question I always ask them is, are you raising wages? And most often the answer is no. And then I say, well, if you want more of something and you're not willing to pay more, then you're just whining, okay? <laughs> That's not how a market economy works. And then the third question I've started asking more recently is, when was the last time labor was available? When was it not like this? And you know the most common answer I get is 2009, 2010. That's telling. So from business's perspective, a good labor environment is when we're crawling out of a recession and there are workers everywhere. Well, that's not, that's not what we're trying to achieve at the Federal Reserve, right? So the bottom line is this, there's a market for labor and supply and demand meet when prices adjust so that they meet. And so the local information helps me make sense of the national data, but I am making my calls based on what we think is best for the national economy. Now, one other comment I'll just say is our regional economy is very reflective of the national economy because most major sectors of the U.S. economy are represented here. We have ag, we have manufacturing, we have healthcare, we have services, we have tech. Generally speaking, what is good for the U.S. economy is going to be good for our region's economy. I was very impressed with you wading into the question of income inequality and what what research or other tools could the Fed have on that? But I haven't heard anything recently. Is there any update on interesting new things you're finding that might inform that question? Yeah, thank you for asking it. So another surprise coming to this region, you know, Minnesota, especially as a state, has so much going for us, right? We have a very, we have a strong economy, a diverse economy. We have a very educated workforce. On average, we have very good schools relative to the nation. But if you look below the averages, we have massive disparities here in Minnesota. That was a surprise to me. <coughs> And as I started talking to researchers at the Minneapolis Fed and around the Federal Reserve System, I found surprisingly few good answers. I'll give you an example. One data point that's very frustrating is that in America, African American unemployment is almost always twice white unemployment. So if it's a booming economy and white unemployment is four, African American unemployment you can bet will be around eight. If it is a recession and white unemployment is seven, African American unemployment is gonna be 14. And that ratio has been consistent. By the way, it's true for college graduate against college graduate. It's true for high school dropout against high school dropout. So I started asking very basic questions of why do these gaps exist? There are racial gaps, there are geographic gaps, lots of different gaps. And I, got, I found very few good answers. And so what we said was, we think we have a role to play in trying to understand, at least unravel these issues, even if we can't solve them by ourselves, if we can do the research that then arms other policymakers like Congress or state legislators, then that's a role that we could play. So last year, at the end of last year, we, or the beginning of this year, we announced what we call the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute. It's a major new research initiative. We've got visiting scholars coming here to Minneapolis, working with us in-house. We've attracted some of the best experts in the world to partner with us to do long-term research to unravel some of these gaps. We recently had a conference on racial segregation to understand the role of segregation in magnifying these gaps. Wide range of speakers, divergent opinions. We're at the earliest days of trying to unravel this, but it's a major focus for us. And it's not just this year. This is a long-term commitment that we're making. And right now we actually have uh, applications out for a new batch of visiting scholars to apply to come to Minneapolis with us next year. It's on our website. Anybody. Uh, who does research in these areas is encouraged to apply. So thanks for asking the question. I wish I had an answer, but it's just a long, these, are, these problems are decades or longer in the making, and we're gonna try to do our part. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, I work for the city of Minneapolis, and I have a question regarding affordable housing. <coughs> So we know that in the last decade, we've lost about 20,000 units of affordable housing, primarily through market force, so not, um, not through any other policy issue. Uh, what I'm curious about is that <clears throat> in the post-war era, post-World War II era, um, there were programs that really incentivized home ownership, and that was a way that white Americans in particular built wealth. Um, and I think we still see that as a panacea for people in terms of wealth building. I'm curious to hear your perspective about how we encourage 
um, communities of color in particular who are living in poverty, um, how do we encourage them to build wealth through home ownership or other means? Do you have some thoughts about that? It's a, it's a huge question. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. No, it's a huge question. Do you know, before you give up the mic, do you, have you heard of Richard Rothstein and his book? Mm -hmm. So he was a keynote speaker at the segregation conference we just had. Uh, this uh, former reporter, I believe, wrote this seminal book looking at America's policies to promote home ownership, which were, the policies were, act I didn't know this, were racially segregated. They were su supporting home ownership amongst lower and middle class white Americans to the exclusion of everybody else. And it had enormously beneficial effects for those who could participate, but then it, it had the effect of leaving other communities behind. And it was literally designed in law targeting at white Americans to the exclusion of others. So that was eye-opening for me. I don't know the answer is the, is the honest answer. I mean, to me, uh, trying to address these gaps of not income and wealth gaps, I mean, income gaps are kind of the first level. Maybe the first level is education gaps. Close education gaps, perhaps you can then close income gaps. But wealth gaps are multi-generation in the making. And how you close those gaps, I don't have a good answer for. But to me, we have to start somewhere. And if we can close the education gaps, close the opportunity gaps, that's at least a place to start. It puts us on a track to closing the wealth gaps. Thank you, and I just, one follow up to that. Um, one of the things that I think we're seeing anecdotally uh, is that there's a strong market push to build um, multifamily uh, affordable housing, but not single family affordable housing. So that equity gap will continue to grow um, if people are not, people who have less means are not able to purchase a home and build wealth that way. And that's just something I want to put into the space. Uh, I don't, I don't, again, I don't have an answer either, but thank you. Yeah, thanks for raising it. Yeah, Alex. Yeah, hi. I'm Alex Bazanz with Real Estate Equities. We're actually a multifamily developer that has kind of a focus on affordable housing. So I kind of wanted to speak to that side of it and yeah. kind of address, you know, your initial point. But, you know, I think one of the, one of the, I mean, there's many challenges in that business. And one of the things that isn't having a flood of, of developers coming into the space when there is so much demand, because there's, I mean, every city you talk to, they have a serious need for affordable housing. And, you know, one of the big <laughs> challenges that's happened is a lot of the natural occurring housing that's always been affordable, that's kind of the 70s and 60s and 80s built stock of housing has been renovated, rents continue to go up, so people are kind of getting you know, squeezed out of that market. And there hasn't been enough backfill of affordable housing supplies. So you know, with the bonding availability, I mean, one of the issues right now that's on the tax reform, and uh, I feel pretty confident that it's gonna be safe, but our private activity bonds, which frankly have fueled probably 40% of you know, all of the affordable housing throughout the U.S. Uh, for the last, you know, 10 plus years. And, you know, there's a bunch of factors that go into really making those work. And one of them is bonding availability. And certain states <clears throat> seem to not really have a capacity issue. Uh, Minnesota um, has a lot of, you know, affordable housing development activity. So the process for getting those bonds has become competitive. So one of the issues that we've been running into as a developer is in putting together these projects, which are very complicated in and of themselves, you have to get a certain amount of bonds to meet a threshold to get tax credits to get the projects funded. Um, and even in doing that, you know, you need to buy the land at a <clears throat> pretty cost-efficient basis, and you need to, um, you know, figure out a, a construction pricing that, you know, is sufficient but can meet, you know, all these different elements of the project and work. Um, and in many cases, or almost every case, you need cities to kind of partner with you with forms like tax increment financing to make the projects financially feasible because the tax credit pricing, <clears throat> you know, reduced probably 20% when Trump went into office. So these projects have become more and more complicated and low interest rates, frankly, is what is making the magic work still because with rates low, you can get HUD financing, Freddie Mac has good programs, and these projects work. Um, they're complicated, they're not easy to put together, and the bonding availability is a big issue. But my concern is if rates go up a full point even, these projects are gonna become extremely hard to do. So I'm saying all that because A, I wanna kinda get your read on that, <laughs> one. But two, there's a lot of complexities involved with it that I think keeps certain folks out of that business because it is so complicated. But two, um, those deals are very hard to put together. You know, there's just so many complicated aspects to it. And I'm really happy to hear that I think the private activity bonds are safe because when you look at all the statistics, and you may know all about all this, but 
there's so much job growth that comes from that business. Um, construction jobs, jobs within the locations these buildings are built, just the local community that it kind of creates and you know what spawns off of that. But it's so important to keep them and I, I'm really happy to hear that I think it's going to continue. But are um, the complexities that you're talking about, and other people have said similar things to me, I would imagine those are magnified in a city. You know, Minneapolis, you try to do something in the city of Minneapolis or St. Paul versus in rural communities. Do you have an experience that could shed some light on that? Cause I, I hear this in rural communities too. And I say to them, I mean, they're you're the city council, different. make it happen. I mean, what's the challenge? Well, yeah, I mean, Jonathan's here, you know, we're working with the city of St. Paul on the Pioneer Press redevelopment, which, you know, was a great project. And we were really happy to be able to partner with the city on that. And we're fortunate to get a bonding allocation from the city to make that project financially viable. I mean, I think when you compare like a suburban location or even a rural location to an urban location, they have different levels of complexity. I mean, urban locations, frankly, there's a lot of demand for bonding capacity and availability throughout the state just generally. But then St. Paul and Minneapolis are their own bonding allocators too. So there's developers that are pursuing those. So, so that's a challenge in and of itself just from getting financing to make the projects work. Um, but, the, but hold on, can I just, that's a pro, that's a, you're saying that's a challenge because you've got competition. So yeah. as a policymaker, that's not that's a good thing from my perspective, right? If you've got lots of developers competing to build this project, I understand why that may not be optimal from your perspective, but isn't that good from the city's perspective? Um, I would say no, because well, some of the issue is that there's there's X amount of bonds allocated per year, but then a large amount of those bonds go to single family home financing for affordable housing development in single family homes, and then they're not used. So there's a certain percentage of bonds that go to multifamily, and I want to say on an annual basis, it's maybe 200 million, maybe a little bit more. And frankly, you know, the number could be double that, and developers would actively build more multifamily projects that would be good for the community. And I don't know what the secret answer is for single family, I'm not in that business, but what I do know is that those bonds that do specifically get allocated for single family housing, uh, I think in most cases are not being fully utilized. Uh, and are sitting on the sidelines. So I think uh, competition is one thing, but if there was, because you, you can't do these projects unless there are bonds. So if the bonds were there for multifamily housing, you would see more affordable housing get created. Got it, thanks. So. <laughs> um, any other questions along, along that line? Yeah, Tim. Uh, Tim Keen, do you see the increased demands with the trillion and a half dollar uh, uh, increase in the national debt putting pressure on the capital markets that will result in uh, interest rate challenges uh, just as a natural outgrowth of the uh, increase command for capital? No, not in the short term. Uh, in the long term, we clearly have to get our fiscal house in order. Uh, but in the short term, this is actually an indicator that I'm paying attention to and what the markets are telling us about the future of the economy, the near-term outlook, which is one thing that surprised me. We've raised interest rates four times, and then three times this year, and then this tax reform package has come together, or tax cut package, rather, and yet the Treasury market isn't reacting to it. One, one would have expected all else being equal that the prices of long-term Treasury bonds would go down and the yields would go up, but they basically haven't moved. So I read from that that markets expect a lower growth environment in the future, low inflation in the future, and that's why the markets are not reacting either to the Fed's moves or to the tax cut. So that's why I don't think the markets are worried about fin financing that tax cut because there still is a lot of demand for Treasury bonds. Nonetheless, long term, there's no question that we, our uh, path of spending is on an unsustainable basis. And over the long term, politically, we have to address it. It's just reaching some kind of political compromise. But in the short term, it doesn't appear to be an issue. 
going back to Charlene Rice with Hess Rice and Company, and we're historical consultants. We work on historic tax credit projects around the state and around the region. Um, but, but going back to the issue of rural versus urban, um, one of the things that we've noticed <coughs> is that um, a lot of times it it's, gets very quirky in individual communities and the willingness of city councils to be open and also building inspectors. And a lot of times they're just not willing to be very flexible. Um, if they are, they can make a big change. Um, but in urban areas, sometimes you run into that also. But sometimes you have more layers you can go through yeah. to try to negotiate. And, and people are a little bit more willing to stick their neck out on stuff. Um, so that's just one of the things that we see is just kind of a lack of experience with different <coughs> options um, in rural areas. And you know, I'm really concerned with the rural areas. I think that in addition to the racial and other cultural income divides, um, the urban-rural thing mm -hmm. is just a huge problem. And um, and I, I get your newsletter, and it's always interesting to look around the region and see, you know, it's like, it's a whole different world um, out there in the agricultural area, and we just yeah. don't think about it here. Yeah, one of the uh, challenges I hear from a lot of rural communities is declining populations. So there are young people that are going away to college, they're hoping that they can entice them to come back, but in many cases they can't. They have better opportunities in the cities, and then they just feel like their populations are declining. What do they do? Uh, and so the communities that have done a better job, you know, one of the things I say to people, I say is, if you look at how economies grow, part of growth comes from productivity growth, which is technology development and education. The other part of growth just comes from population growth. More people, more consumers, more workers. And our populations are growing more slowly just because we're having fewer kids than we had in prior generations. So I always say to people, you have three choices. You can either, number one, accept slower growth. Number two, you can try to subsidize fertility, which people always laugh when I say that, but you can try. Right? You can, tax credits and child care, it's pretty expensive. Or number three, you can embrace immigration. Those are your three choices, and that's just math. You can decide whatever you want. I was in one rural community in Montana where somebody actually said, you know, I get what you're saying. Low growth doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> I was surprised by that. Most people, when facing those options, say, you know what, maybe we need to think about immigration as a way to keep our communities vibrant. Some rural communities have done a better job of that and have embraced immigration successfully, and they've got their populations growing. One thing that I learned recently, I was in Winona, and I was meeting with a group of small business leaders, and affordable housing came up big topic of conversation. I said, wait a second, let me understand this. You've got the universities here, so the, the, and the local community is, pretty, is doing well, but they don't have enough affordable housing units for workers that they could be employing. And I said, well, if you, how far out of town would you have to go to build on vacant land? Oh, two or three miles. <laughs> <laughs> it's all farmland today. And I said, you know, the entire history of America is converting farmland into housing units. What exactly is the problem? And so local willpower actually matters to tackle these issues. And so that's why I'm trying to unravel this and say, are there real structural barriers or is it just a lack of will? And if it's just a lack of will, that's not a public policy problem. One of the things that's come up um, in particular in this in the last week or so uh, with net neutrality uh, discussions. And I'm not sure if the Fed has any way of influencing any of that, but you know, back in the 30s, uh, rural electrification uh, was a huge push in order to get uh, rural areas. And the same is true now with internet access and everything else. Um, you know, what do you feel about the, the whole net neutrality issue? I mean, to me, it seems like everybody should be given the opportunity. It's, it's, it's more like a regular utility. Um, well, and so, you know, yeah. what are your I'm thoughts on that? I'm not an expert on this, but I think they're two separate issues. I think one issue is, I agree with you that, you know, I think as a country we decided electrification is so important to people, we need to just make it happen. And I think that that's true for the internet too. But I think that that is a distinct issue from how you price internet traffic, uh, which I think is what this net neutrality regulations are about. Uh, so I do think, you know, rural communities need access to the internet just like you and I do. And there needs, we need to find a way this is clearly the domain of fiscal policy. We need to find a way to make that happen. Um, but I do think it's a distinct issue. Hi there, I'm Nino Hi. Pedrelli, and uh, I graduated uh, <clears throat> college in 1978, so I've been through four real estate downturns in my career. And uh, each one of them has had that yield, cur the flattening of the yield curve piece. But then, I don't know whether she was misquoted, but I thought I saw her in the Star Tribune this morning that 
Uh, Janet Yellen has said that there's evidence that the yield curve and the business cycle is um, correlated. Not following is it's tr it's not following its traditional um, pattern. Let's say. So I was kind of surprised by that since it's been antithesis, you know, for everything I've seen. But um, so that I was just wondering if you could explain what evidence she's looking at, sure. and then my only take on affordable housing is uh, sort of like what we did in the early 80s, even though it was disastrous towards the end, was, you know, usually the best way to provide affordable housing is let your developers blow their brains out. You know, <laughs> supply a market with 200 units that really only has a demand for 100 units, and guess what you have? Affordable housing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what, uh, what Chair Yellen was talking about was something we call the term premium. So if you look at the difference between short-term interest rates and long-term interest rates. You could think of long-term interest rates if you just roll over debt year over year over year as you add up all these short-term interest rates and then you get a long-term interest rate plus some inflation risk in there. But if you strip out inflation and you strip out the expected path of short-term interest rates, there's something called the term premium, which is a fancy word for the residual. It's this extra stuff, extra compensation investors get for holding a long-term bond that, I mean, per, be perfectly honest, we don't fully understand, but it's there, and it's been there historically. And in response to quantitative easing, we think, in response to quantitative easing around the world, that term premium has been compressed to around zero today. And so what, the, what Chair Yellen was saying is that it's a little bit hard to compare the yield curve and the shape of the yield curve today to 10 years ago or 20 or 30 years ago, because this term premium, this residual, is now very low today. And so it's a little bit apples and oranges. That's what she's saying. And I'm not disagreeing with her. I do think it is an imperfect comparison. But I do think there's information contained in the fact that we've been raising rates. Congress is now passing this tax package. And the long end of the curve is not moving. That, that is telling me that the bond market is worried about the growth prospects going forward and inflation prospects going forward. And we should take that seriously. During the day, I uh, work with the Minnesota Housing Partnership advocating for affordable housing. And at night, I volunteer at the uh, St. Louis Park City Council. Um, but recently, I have, I have several questions. One, uh, when you got the Hamilton Award, did you get tickets to Hamilton? <laughs> <laughs> that was in 2008. I, I did see oh. Hamilton, but it was long before. <laughs> okay. Um, Last year, about a year and a half ago, when I was looking, I was doing development through Beacon, a local affordable housing developer, we were looking in Orono. We looked on a zoning map in Orono, and there was one site that was zoned multifamily that was not developed, one in the city. Drive out there, and there's a huge sign for single family home development. So as you're talking about some of the challenges, absolutely, I think localities play a role in that, because there's literally not a site that's <laughs> available to do that uh, in Orono. By the way, um, we found a site in Plymouth. But um, my question is back to this thing, uh, question about low income housing tax credits. Right now, um, it is a scarce resource. The tax credits are the scarce resource. Fully, they're oversubscribed at the state, locally. Um, there are two to three times more projects that are applying each year than are getting funded. And even those, if they were funded, would not get close to addressing the gap. So there's a couple bills at the uh, uh, in Congress to fill that gap and to add more money to the tax credit. So I wanted to understand from your perspective, because I understand the market economy and competition is a good thing, but this is that public resource which is one of the key ways to actually get to those affordabilities. And then the other side of that would be um, there's several studies that have come out recently that have really drawn the line with rent subsidies, saying that actually with um, rental supports, families you know, can be stable, get access to housing, you know, right. um, serve the workforce that we're trying to serve. And what, your, what is your thought on the rental side as well, the rental subsidy side? Well, I think the first part is, uh, I mean, this is purely the domain of fiscal policy, which is, you know, Congress decides how much they want to collect in tax and what they want to spend it on. And so I think what you're saying, I mean, I appreciate you sharing that. I think that that makes sense. And that is really for our elected leaders to decide that this is a priority versus whether it's education or healthcare or something else. So I take what you're saying at face value and I'm not pushing back at all. On the rental side, one of our uh, advisors gave a presentation about moving to opportunity as an idea of how do you help low income families have a better outcomes for themselves, for their kids, et cetera. And some of the research has shown that rental subsidies 
into middle class neighborhoods is actually very effective in achieving better outcomes for the families in, in many different aspects of it. Uh, and so I think that that, again, the research has shown that that can be very, very promising. But again, it goes back to we have finite resources and our elected representatives have to decide you know, how they set the priorities relative to all of their other spending priorities. But what we're trying to do is do the best research we can, arm the public with the data and with the evidence in a nonpartisan way, and then let our elected leaders make the best decisions that they can. Bruce Chamberlain, you said something that made me cringe just a little bit. Just one thing? <laughs> Only one thing. Oh my gosh. Um, you had mentioned you were in, in Wabasha, I think, and, and for them to think Winona. a little more broadly, Winona, a little more broadly about their development pattern. And I think for a number of generations, uh, we've taken that pattern of continually expanding out from our core cities or core communities, and it's led to a, what I believe is an imbalance in our infrastructure um, pattern or the cost of infrastructure and the cost of mobility to those who are living around our communities. Um, and we focus on affordable housing because it's by far the most direct and easiest thing for us to, to focus on. But I think what truly is happening is that we've created a pattern of living that has exceeded our ability to pay for it and our ability to continually reinvest in it. So I would encourage um, a discussion about overall costs of living. Uh, affordable housing is certainly one and a primary one, but there's more to it. And I think that the way we've developed um, the United States um, is a very expensive development pattern. You're talking about sprawl. Sprawl. You could call it sprawl, but it doesn't I even make have sure to I understood. be sprawl. Yeah. Um, well, so but, but I, I let me ask you, though. So I, yeah. And I don't disagree, but... If you're talking about a small community, mid-sized community, I mean, you're, you're basically saying to them, don't build out, build up, presumably. And I think it's easy to say that. It's probably harder to convince. I mean, are there communities that are small communities that you've been able to convince build up instead of building out? It seems like that's not an easy sale. But well, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, well, I, th I think it's not easy because we've made our infrastructure costs so low and so hidden to the overall cost of our existence. I see. Thank you. So. Oh, I've got the mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to share a quick thing, and I will try to turn this into uh, a question. Um, you don't Nick, have to. Oh, OK. Well, um, again, thank you for being here. I want to talk about the graphic that I showed you when you first came. And folks, what I'm talking about is a picture that stopped me in my tracks yesterday. And I want to thank you also for your work in um, racial justice or racial inequity and in dealing with that. The graphic that I saw was the city of Minneapolis um, housing affordability by census tract. And it was divided up into communities of color, into Hispanic communities, and white communities. And it was color coded. And my friends, it was painful to look at. Uh, and the inequities that were so obvious there, and this gets now finally to the question in your opening remarks about the equation, whether you're talking about the cost of affordable housing or having the wherewithal and capacity, the income to purchase housing. And I'm talking about purchase, not just renting, getting people on that ownership track. Um, <clears throat> I wish I was smarter and knew more about what you can do in your seat and what the Federal Reserve is doing, and maybe this is where you comment on that, to help with these gigantic gaps. Um, and I'm happy to show that graphic to anybody in the sure. room. It is compelling. Thank well, you, the, sir. We are, we are the central bank, so we have direct control over monetary policy, so interest rates, to achieve our dual mandate goals that I talked about. We get very involved in bank regulation. We supervise banks. Uh, but beyond that, we are a research engine. And we do research to try to understand the drivers of uh, employment and the drivers of inflation and overall economic growth. And so you know, we're not a grant-making authority. That's up to Congress, and that's up to the uh, federal agencies and state agencies. But So we're limited in being able to do research that we think advances our mission 
and that can inform other policymakers so that they can make the best decisions that they can make. And so we're limited in what we can do, but again, we're going to try to do our part, and that's going to be from a research perspective. Thank you for your work, and I hope that they're listening. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Jeremy Foss, I just have a more of a statement than a question. It had to do with going off of the cost of infrastructure. And I think the infrastructure costs, they're not necessarily forcing you to develop in a certain way, saying go two stories or go single family or you know single story going out. But I think it, it asks a bigger question of the local municipalities on what they can actually afford from an infrastructure standpoint. And that part is kind of what would help them determine what's the best development pattern. Meaning, like, if you, if you decided you wanted to, to expand out a certain way with, let's say, 200 new homes, but the infrastructure to do that is going to put you over on your budget, that, that's a problem. So you have, to, you have to think about it differently. So I don't think it's a matter of controlling um, <clears throat> or saying that two stories is, is the way to go. It's what works best for that, that municipality and the, the local budget. Yep. And that, that directly affects... That, that directly affects Affordable how the affordable housing question as well, and what makes sense to develop where. So, yeah, thank you. So, Neil, another question. Um, I had mentioned uh, when you and I talked uh, ahead of time that uh, we had built the Federal Reserve. Our company does a lot of higher end commercial construction, and there are a number of companies here that are represented. We don't do a lot of housing, but we've been disappointed in the last 10 years. We called it the lost decade since uh, 2006 with the lack of investment of the big, the big corporations in new facilities and infrastructure and things of that nature. Um, we've had to shift, frankly, to do more public work, more higher education, where the money is. And I'm, I'm curious about a couple things. One, the tax bill has talked about this repatriation of dollars from overseas. I'm curious what you see, if that were to happen, if this passes, what's the Fed's position? What's your personal opinion on what that might do to juice juice things a bit, put more capital in the hands of U.S. corporations, and are they going to spend it? And if so, where are they going to spend it? Uh, and, and in general, I'm curious about the tax law and what you think. But I have to make one comment. You talked about subsidization of fertilization. I have five daughters. I have 13 grandkids. If you can do that retroactively, I'll love you. Okay? I'm not going to comment on your family situation. Um, so in terms of repatriation and what effect that's likely going to have, you know, the companies that have all this cash abroad generally are very large companies that have global operations that have no trouble whatsoever tapping the capital markets tomorrow at very cheap rates. So if Apple wanted to build a plant, they don't, they're not capital constrained in building a plant. They would be building that plant, and they already tapped the debt markets. So my best guess what's going to happen is these very large global companies are going to bring cash back and buy back their stock and increase their dividends. So early on you mentioned you talked to a lot of CEOs who don't raise wages and complain about a lack of labor. What, what's the best way to raise wages? Is it, is it you know, like tax cuts for corporations or is it the other side where cities try to raise minimum wage? And if it's the latter, is it better at a city or a state or a national level? I think in, the, in terms of minimum wage, personally, I think it's best done uh, locally where they can assess the local conditions. You know, they're, they're, they're winners and losers. Uh, let's be honest about it. So if you're starting from a position of high unemployment and you raise the minimum wage, you're going to make it harder for people who don't have jobs to find jobs. Right? That's basic economics. If you're starting from a place of very low unemployment, there are probably fewer unintended consequences. Fewer people are displaced by raising the minimum wage. And so my, my judgment is these kind of decisions are best made locally or regionally as opposed to one size fits all for the whole country. I think that that's much blunter and more difficult. Overall, one of the things I'm learning is that a strong economy with an overall strong job market in theory should raise everybody's wages, right? It, it, raises, it creates more jobs that are available and it raises wages for those who have jobs without kicking people out of the job market. And so that, to me, is the you know, kind of the win-win scenario where there really are no, uh, there no, nobody loses in that event. And so that's what we're trying to achieve. Maximum employment is the mission that Congress has given us, and I hope that we're able to achieve it. 
Um, I applaud your work and thanks for being here with us today. Thank you. Uh, let's spend a minute on real estate cap rates. You know, a lot of times we measure our investment performance based on an exit cap. And uh, for us, despite the three rate increases, we've seen really cap rates stay flat and as low as they've been historically in the real estate market that we've ever seen. Can you share your perspective as to where you think cap rates may go and whether or not it's the fact that we've got a lot of baby boomers and other pensioners moving into fixed income times of their investment cycle and that that protracted 5 or 6% return may be an acceptable return for a prolonged period of time for those well, I don't, you would have a better view than I would on where cap rates are going and where real estate valuations are. We do, first of all, we do pay attention to asset prices as we try to look out for financial stability risks. So let me, I'm going to get to your specific question in a moment. A lot of people will say, look at the stock market, it's booming. Fed, why aren't you raising rates to do something about it? And the answer is, if we were to try to use monetary policy to control the stock market, it might be very costly to the economy. So in 1996, you might recall Alan Greenspan was chairman of the Fed. And he declared irrational exuberance, saying the stock market is overvalued. Well, if the Fed had tried to use monetary policy in 1996 to stop the stock market from climbing further, I think it would have been very costly to the economy. Now, the stock market corrected in 2000, as you know. And that correction was painful for investors. But it didn't cause a financial crisis. It caused a very, fairly minor recession. So my th concern is if we try to use monetary policy to control asset prices, we might inflict more harm than the damage we're trying to prevent through a correction. As opposed to, so that's the tech bubble bursting, as opposed to the real estate bubble in 05, 06, 07, leading to the housing crisis. That led to a real financial stability event, a terrible recession, terrible crisis. So we try to look for signs of financial risk and financial stability risk. And we're not, although we are seeing where commercial real estate is priced, we're not seeing this massive leverage building across the US economy the way we saw in 05, 06, 07. That's why, though our eyes are open for these risks, we don't think that this is building to be an 08 type scenario. If there's a stock market correction, it's more likely to be a 2000 scenario than an 08 type scenario. Then in terms of asset prices and returns going forward, uh, I talked about this when I talked about the bond market. One of the concepts that's uh, central to central banking, and sorry I'm getting kind of complicated here, is the concept of a neutral real interest rate. What interest rate balances savings and investment in the economy? Over the last 30 years, it's gradually been trending down. That's not because of us. That's because of broader macroeconomic forces like demographic trends, technology, trade, et cetera. I think the markets are pricing in a, low tr a lower long-term interest rate environment because of those broader macroeconomic forces. That could explain the high real estate asset prices that you're talking about that could explain the higher stock prices that we're talking about. That doesn't guarantee there's not going to be a correction, but that could explain why things are priced where they are if markets are pricing in a lower discount rate going forward. Sorry, long, complicated answer, but it's a complicated question. We have time for one more, and if Russ promises not to drop the mic when you're done, <laughs> you, you can ask it. Neil, thanks for being here. Thank you. I always love your remarks. Very interesting. You, you, this is a bah humbug question in this time of holiday spirit. You mentioned that the biggest threat to our economy is the unsustained increase in federal debt. Over the long term. Over the long term. We'll get to how we define long term, but the federal debt. It seems to me that you know, when Obama took office, uh, the, the federal deficit was $12 trillion. It's now 20 roughly, I think. $8 trillion increase, and we're wringing our hands over possible $1.5 trillion deficit created over 10 years, kind of go in perspective. But if we don't get control of spending, that debt continues. And the only areas you can control it are Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security, I think. So there you go, bah humbug. How do we solve this one? Well, this is, I mean, this is purely a political question of how we want to pull these different levers. You know, if you think about just Social Security as an example, we know this. The, the math is easy. You can raise the retirement age. You can cut benefits, you can raise taxes, or you can means test. You basically have four or five levers, and then each of us would probably pull the levers a little bit different from one another in how we'd optimize it. So literally, this is not a math question. It's a political question of how do we reach consensus on which combination will resolve this. And broadly speaking, that's true for healthcare too. So I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Neither am I. But I think we can agree that those are the only areas that would provide 
significant areas for reduction? The military. Well, the military is already baked in. It's uh, we, all right, some, but not much. No. Uh, the numbers, how much in military? Well, again, these are the these. You two can take this debate offline. <laughs> 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 But the point is, we have to cut spending. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. This has been a wonderful session. Thank you. For thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.